Well, welcome to SAD's Safe Schools webinar for school nurses. I'm Marcia Baker, the program director of the SADS Foundation. We're pleased that you have joined us today from all across the country. And before beginning the webinar, uh, just a couple reminders. First, just please keep your audio muted during the presentation. And then following the presentation, we'll have lots of time for questions. And you may also type your question in the chat during the presentation and we'll, we can address some of those as we go along. Um, if you wanna ask your question verbally, you feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question, especially at the end. Our webinar is being recorded today and the link will be shared with all of you. Please feel free to share this with your fellow nurse colleagues. On behalf of the SADS Foundation team, I'm pleased to introduce our presenter today, Bryn Decker. Bryn is a pediatric nurse practitioner in electrophysiology at the University of Michigan Congenital Heart Center in Ann Arbor. Bryn received her Master's of Science in Nursing degree from Loyola University Chicago in 2004 and has worked with pediatric arrhythmia patients since that time for the past 17 years. In her current role at the University of Michigan, she cares for patients with sudden death conditions, children and adolescents with arrhythmias, and those with pacemakers and implantable cardiac defibrillators. In addition to her clinical role, she has multiple research interests in pediatric patients with arrhythmias and sudden death conditions. Bryn is a board member of the SADS Foundation and an active member of our medical education committee. So thank you, Bryn, for volunteering to speak today. And I'll turn this over to you to share your screen. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here on this nice fall day here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I know many of you are from Michigan. So welcome and welcome to our um, participants from all across the country. Um, as Marcia said, I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner and EP in electrophysiology, where I've spent the majority of my career. Um, I love what I do, and I'm um, very uh, indebted to the SADS Foundation who, for welcoming me as, as a fairly newer person here in EP, so um, it's, it's a great foundation to work with. So today we're going to be talking about um, SAD safe schools. Again, I know all your school nurses, um, and I'd be happy to answer questions during or after the presentation. So what is the SADS mission? The mission of SADS is to save the lives and support the families of children and young adults who are genetically predisposed to sudden death due to heart rhythm abnormalities. Sudden cardi cardiac death in the young occurs in, on average or each year in the US greater than 300, 356,000 Americans die suddenly due to cardiac arrhythmias. Greater than 7,000 of these are young people under the age of 18. To put this in perspective, every hour, a young patient under the, 18, under the age of 18 dies from sudden cardiac arrest. Sudden cardiac death is one of the leading causes of death in young adults. What are SADS conditions? These include long QT syndrome, catecholaminergic, polymorphic, ventricular tachycardia, or CPVT for short, Brugada syndrome, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There are some other congenital heart conditions that can cause sudden death as well, but today we're gonna to focus on more of the genetic or arrhythmic aspect. So what about these conditions? What are the, what's the overview of sudden death conditions? Many times these are diagnosed in childhood, which is where my role comes in. They can be related to a genetic disorder, they can have varying clinical manifestations, meaning completely normal to an aborted sudden cardiac arrest or even a death in the family. There's also varying treatment from monitoring a patient to giving them medication to a procedure such as an implantable cardiac defibrillator. Yeah. Aborted sudden cardiac arrest may be the first symptom. In long QT syndrome, this occurs up to 24% and in patients with CPVT up to 50%. So thinking about that, a sudden cardiac arrest may be the first symptom, and that's what scares us the most. There can be delayed diagnosis on many occasions. Sometimes we can't pick these up on screening or EKGs. Obviously, this is very devastating to the family and the community. I'm gonna go through each one of these conditions fairly briefly, but I'd be happy to answer any more detailed questions if anyone has uh, questions about the specific disease itself. Long QT syndrome is estimated in one in 2000 patients. It's characterized by a prolonged QT interval, which can lead to torsades to point. There are multiple different types of long QT syndrome. 
so many, we, we actually are, are beginning to lose count. There are certain drugs that can prolong the QT interval and make this condition worse or even exacerbate arrhythmia. In this picture shown here, it's a normal EKG followed by torsades to points. We're starting with this arrhythmia, and that's what can happen in patients with long QT syndrome. Each one of these, present, each one of these diseases, I'm going to go along with a case presentation that comes from my own library of patients that I've cared for. First is a 16-year-old girl with a history of seizures that was diagnosed in 2007. She was medically treated. Later, about five or six years later, she presented after cardiac arrest while in the car with her boyfriend. Her boyfriend was able to perform CPR and saved her life. 911 was called, EMS arrived. She was shocked with 200 joules for ventricular fibrillation and life flighted to our hospital. Her QT was very, very long. A normal QT is less than 450 on average. Her QT was greater than 650, which is extremely long, placing her at very high risk for arrhythmias. She was started on a beta blocker. Natalol was the specific drug that we chose. She had an ICD placed for what we call secondary prevention, meaning she suffered a cardiac arrest. We had gene testing sent. She was shown to have long QT syndrome type two, and the rest of her family was negative. She currently has one child who also has the same genetic defect and is positive for long QT type two. Since starting beta blocker and implanting her ICD, she's had no further episodes. The interesting part for her is she did not have a seizure disorder. Her seizure events were related to arrhythmia and were misdiagnosed several years ago. Our second uh, condition I'm gonna talk about is catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Super mouthful of a word there, but the short version is CPVT. It's estimated in one in 10,000 and characterized by bidirectional ventricular tachycardia that can occur with exercise or adrenaline situations like fighting, extreme emotion, anxiety, any of those things. Our case today is a 15 year old female presented after years of seizures, we're seeing a little bit of a pattern here, who had been followed by neurology. Her episodes were described as lasting 30 to 60 seconds, and they occurred two to three times per week, sometimes multiple times per day. They were triggered by anxiety, leaving the house, visitors to the house, school, public places, and social situations. Because of this, she became homebound. She was not able to leave the house. She's not able to go to school. And after these continued to happen, despite treating her for what was called a seizure disorder, she eventually came to our clinic in cardiology several years ago. It just so happened since she was out of the house and very anxious about being out of the house, she had a typical episode while in our clinic room. And I will never forget this day. We had a cardiologist who's one of uh, electrophysiologists that I was working with that day who was very smart and had the EKG text get an EKG of what was happening. And this is what we found. It's very rare to have a, a 12 lead EKG of this condition because usually it's happening at a time where you wouldn't have an EKG machine next to you. As you can see here, she's in ventricular tachycardia with the QRS morphology changing. So it's going from down to up and that's the polymorphic part of it. We, we were able to um, provide CPR in our clinic room. We hospitalized her. We started her on a beta blocker, again, Natalol, which is the drug of choice for, the, for the, these two conditions, long QT syndrome and CPVT. She had gene testing that was positive for CPVT, and it was negative in her parents and all of her siblings. She was called a de novo case, meaning she was the only, she was the first patient in this family to have this genetic condition. We decided not to place an ICD, different than our first patient with long QT syndrome, because of concerns of what's called ICD storm, meaning if she goes into an arrhythmia and it shocks her, that's just going to create more anxiety, more pain, and cause more arrhythmias. And you can have an ICD storm, and there can be fatal events due to an ICD storm. The beta blocker has held her very well. She's had no episodes in over 10 years and is now able to go to church. That was what she wanted to do most, was be able to go to church and sit in the pews on, on a Sunday. And now she's able to do that because of her diagnosis and being started on the proper treatment. Next is Brigada syndrome, more rare. Um, its estimated prevalence is um, much lower than the rest of these. It's characterized by an abnormal EKG and ventricular fibrillation or sudden cardiac arrest. This happens usually while sleeping. It usually presents in the fourth decade, decade of life. So it's rare that we see it in children. And if it presents in childhood, there's a high risk of arrhythmia recurrence. 
Drugs and fever can exacerbate this condition. So as you can imagine, you have a four-year-old who has been diagnosed with uh, Brugada syndrome. Four-year-olds get fevers quite frequently. So what we tell these parents is to treat the fever quickly, but it can be a very much anxiety-provoking condition. Brugada has a very specific type of EKG appearance. These are the three different types of Brugada. As you can see, or uh, in the picture to, the, to your left, type one Brugada has a very peaked ST segment. Type two has more of a, a, a capped presentation. And type three has again, an abnormal ST segment. And these are classic signs of Brugada. In our next patient, she's a 10 year old girl with a several year history of syncope and altered level of consciousness. Her dad has a very remote history that they possibly thought that he had a Brugada pattern on an EKG when he had a fever, but he'd never had symptoms. He had gone in with a severe upper respiratory infection to the hospital, had a little bit of chest pain and a fever, and they performed an EKG, and they thought, well, maybe he's got Brugada, but no gene testing was sent at the time, and he had been fine with no episodes of syncope or, or cardiac arrest. He had a normal EKG. We did a drug challenge to help figure out if this is the disease that she had, which was normal, and an echo, as well as an exercise test. Nothing came about, and we decided to put an implantable loop recorder in her, which is a small monitor that goes right under the skin that records constantly and is able to send us information remotely, automatically, if there's any arrhythmia. That, again, was implanted in 2016. She went a couple years with no arrhythmia until she had a fever, and then this is what we saw. So this is the, from her tracing. It was a normal sinus rhythm followed by um, salvos of ventricular tachycardia followed by sustained ventricular tachycardia, which eventually went into ventricular fibrillation. We actually did not know about this right away. She came out on her own. She didn't really remember that episode. She did not pass out. But when I asked her about this date and she said, oh yeah, I had a really bad cold that week. We repeated all the Brugada testing again, which was normal. We decided to send gene testing and also scheduled her ICD. The day before her ICD, she actually serendipitously got a fever again. So we brought her to our clinic. I had the parents give her Tylenol before she left. And then I brought her into our clinic and I let the Tylenol wear off while I was sitting there watching her. And then she had a spontaneous, EK, she had an EKG, a spontaneous EKG pattern showing Brugada because she had a fever and we were able to confirm the diagnosis before the gene testing came back. We put in an ICD, a different type of ICD called a subcutaneous ICD. We sent gene testing. She was positive. Her father is positive and she has one sibling who's positive as well. Her dad and her sibling have both never had any episodes and her sibling also has um, an implantable uh, cardiac monitor. Brugada syndrome does not respond to beta blocker like our other diseases that we were talking about. So there isn't a great medication for this group of patients. Next is arrhythmic right, right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Its estimated prevalence is one in 2000 to one in 5,000. It's characterized by an RV myocardial, myocardial atrophy with fibrofatty replacement leading to ventricular instability and ventricular arrhythmias. This picture here shows a small pathology uh, of, of the right ventricle showing fibrofatty infiltrates, which can lead to scarring and ventricular arrhythmias. This is a progressive disease. So just because an echo or an MRI shows nothing significant in the beginning, it can progress as you age. It can also progress the more you exercise. So these patients are very much restricted from exercise. Our next patient is a 15 year old um, who did end up having ARVC who presented after one week history of palpitations and emesis and was noticed, noted to be in ventricular tachycardia. She probably had been in ventricular tachycardia for a week. She was cardioverted in an outside hospital. She required several more cardioversions for ventricular tachycardia. We started a beta blocker. We put in an ICD. Unfortunately, she continued to have ventricular tachycardia and was shocked for these um, several times in four months. We did an ablation on her. Um, she recurred, her ventricular tachycardia recurred. She had more ICD shocks. She was again hospitalized and started on a different type of beta blocker called Sotolol. And um, eventually she became very anxious to these shocks. So this is her tachycardia here. So this is a wide complex tachycardia. This is from her device. And this circle that I put um, on this slide where it says 29.8 joules was the shock, which converts her to normal sinus rhythm. Eventually we were able to do a different type of ablation with our adult colleagues. And since that time, which I believe is probably seven years now, she's had no further shocks. 
She had genetic counseling at the time, but it took us two years to get approval for genetic testing. And finally, we were able to send off genetic testing. We knew the diagnosis was likely ARBC and we're able to confirm that with gene testing several years later. To this day, she remains on anti-anxiety medications from the PTSD she has from the multiple shocks that she's gotten, but she's overall doing very well. Lastly, Wolf Parkinson White, is the presence of an abnormal accessory electrical conduction pathway between the atria and the ventricles. It's estimated in 0.1 to 0.3% of the population and characterized by an abnormal EKG, which is shown here. The slurring of the EKG where the arrow is from the P wave to the QRS is called a delta wave. And there is a very small chance of sudden death in these patients. This is the only one that I'm talking about today that is not genetic. It can be genetic, but there is no common gene for Wolf Parkinson White. You can you can have multiple people in one family with with Wolf, Wolf, sorry with Wolf Parkinson White, but it's not a genetic condition. So how does Wolf Parkinson White work? These are the most common patients that you might see as school nurses. Is the picture on the left here shows the normal conduction, which goes from the SA node to the AB node and then down to the ventricles, with the picture on the right, which shows the bypass or the accessory pathway where the uh, impulse can travel quickly down to the ventricles. So what can happen with these patients? There's a risk of sudden death about 0.25% per year or three to 4% over a lifetime. These numbers are probably starting to change. We're doing a lot of prospective and retrospective studies on lar large cohorts of patients, young patients with Wolf Parkinson White um, through our uh, center in Utah. We're all working together on a multi-center, many multi-center studies looking at the risk of these patients. And we're actually beginning to find out that there might be more risk than we, than we once knew. Our next patient is a 16-year-old male who complains of palpitations um, and tachycardia. He presented to the emergency department in abnormal rhythm. He did require a shock for this. He, this was a supraventricular arrhythmia, not a ventricular arrhythmia. His EKG showed the delta wave, which confirmed the diagnosis of Wolf Parkinson White. We're able to perform an ablation, which is a catheter-based pr procedure. I've talked about this now twice, so I'll just explain it a little bit. Um, it's an outpatient procedure where we put um, small thin tubes or catheters into the femoral veins at the top of the groin. We are able to find that accessory catheter, uh, pathway using our catheters and actually eliminate it using either radiofrequency or cryoablation and get rid of the tachycardia for these patients. After the ablation is performed, he's cured of Wolf Parkinson White, is able to return to full activity, and really has no long-term sequelae. So many of these other, all of the other conditions I'm talking about today are lifelong. Wolf Parkinson White can be treated and cured, so they no longer have that risk. Here is Wolf Parkinson White in atrial fibrillation. So as you can see, a patient comes, with, comes in with atrial fibrillation, which is a very common arrhythmia. We see that all the time, and it can quickly, uh, uh, move to the ventricle causing ventricular fibrillation and patient and that's where the risk of sudden death comes from. The accessory pathway allows um, a very uh, direct connection between the atria and the ventricles as I said earlier. Lastly is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Its estimated prevalence is one in 500. This is also a genetic condition and also progressive disease. It is the number one cause of death in athletes. It's characterized by thickening of the left ventricle, which leads to ventricular arrhythmias and sudden death. This picture here shows here on the left, a normal heart with a very normal looking septum and apex compared to the picture on the right where it looks much fatter. Um, and that's the thickening of the left ventricle, which leads to these types of arrhythmias and possible sudden death. Our 12 year old uh, with symptoms of dizziness and nausea, headache, diarrhea presents um, to a clinic noted to have a murmur, murmur with a significant, significantly abnormal EKG. This was an outside center who referred quickly after that, that. This EKG shows various changes, ST changes, very high voltages in the QRS. This helped us make the diagnosis or the uh, presumed diagnosis of cardiomyopathy. He again was referred to our center. We did an echo. He had severe septal thickening. His maximal thickness was over three, which was uh, it's very thick. His LB is severely hypertrophied or thickened. In most of these patients, we do an MRI to look at the right ventricle and the left ventricle. And the treatment for him or this patient was beta blocker. We can put an ICD and also some exercise restrictions. So what is the treatment of SADS conditions? And obviously they always, they vary depending on the type of condition and even the type 
of um, the variation of the genes. So as I said earlier, long QT syndrome has multiple types or multiple genetic uh, abnormalities. Um, long QT1, it usually happens with exercise. Long QT2 can happen postpartum or while waking up. And long QT3 can happen while sleeping. Most of these patients with long QT syndrome do well with a beta blocker. But as I said earlier, patients with Brugada syndrome do, are not treated with, uh, with beta blocker. There is a one medication that we could use, quinidine, which is a QID medication and suboptimal for, for children. There's a lot of side effects. We rarely use quinidine for our patients with Brugada. We can also do corrective surgery or procedures, as I talked about earlier in ablation. There are procedures we can do for long QT syndrome and CPVT, that's a left cardiac sympathetic denervation. It's a very uh, specific um, and specialized procedure. It is one that we do not perform at University of Michigan. Mayo Clinic performs this procedure and probably um, many other uh, sites out there, um, but it is very specialized um, for, for these types of pa patients. We can put an ICD in certain patients that we feel are at higher risk for sudden death. ICDs do have their own issues. As I explained earlier, the young gal who was getting shocked from her ICD um, had significant PTSD. That, those were appropriate shocks, but you can also have inappropriate shocks due to uh, atrial arrhythmias. You can have lead fractures. Um, so we really do think twice about putting an ICD. We also encourage patients to avoid certain medications for certain types of diseases. For Brugada, there's a list of these drugs that are you can find on a website called brugadadrugs.org. So if you have a patient in your school, you'd want to look this up. Um, most of the drugs that are on that list are pretty we wouldn't be prescribing at a, at a school or they wouldn't come to school on these medications, but are important to know what they are. Long QT drugs are a little bit um, more uh, prevalent out there. There are certain types of antibiotics that can prolong the QT interval. These are the mycin drugs, so azithromycin, um, uh, which is what a very common antibiotic that we would use can make the QT longer. Zofran, which is something that they use very frequently um, in ERs and things like that for belly pain. These drugs can be found at CredibleMeds.org. It does require that you register and have a password, but there's no fee or anything like that. Um, but a good, uh, good list to have um, for you. What we tell the families is to have these lists kind of on their phone or in their pocket, just because not everyone knows about these conditions or are very uh, understanding of what drugs can, can um, exacerbate these conditions. And in many patients, we have to restrict, restrict sports. The restrictions are changing little by little, but most of these patients do have some sort of sports restriction, at least for a little bit of time. So how can we prevent, uh, or how can we detect these conditions before they happen? First, in, in my world in cardiology, we obtain an accurate patient and family history. We wanna know exactly what's going on in the family. A physical or a sports physical are very important for families. Um, screening, testing like EKGs can be something that we can, um, can do, but conditions like, like CPVT, you would not find an abnormal EKG. They would have a completely normal EKG. They would also have a normal echo. And also be prepared, which we're gonna talk about a little bit. Secondly, this is where I think the school nurses come into play, recognize red flags. So these are the things we wanna know about syncope or passing out with exercise, chest pain with exercise. And if you see these or you're concerned about this, I would you know, contact the families and maybe the, even the primary care physician to let them know this happened and encourage them to refer to cardiology, pediatric cardiology or electrophysiology um, in, uh, specifically. So when doing a syncope history or a passing out history, we look at the state of activity prior to the event. So is this during exercise or after? Obviously it can become a little kind of vasovagal after exercise, but you wanna, be, you wanna clarify. We also wanna know what position they were in, sitting, standing, were they going from sitting to standing? Were they supine? That's very unusual to have an arrhythmic syncope if you're laying down. We wanna know the type of activity associated with the vent. We wanna hear about the length of loss of consciousness, the prodrome, meaning um, do they feel dizzy before? Do they feel their heart racing? We usually talk to witness accounts if we can. So if it's on a school playground, we may call the teacher, we may call a school nurse, principal, other kids that were around. We wanna ask about incontinence. I have a question from Stephanie. So I'm gonna stop for a second. Stephanie, you just popped up. And if you wanna ask something, go ahead. All 
All right, I'll keep going. Okay, so witness accounts, like I said, we wanna know about incontinence, whether they lost bowel or, or bladder. Um, were there any abnormal movements, any abnormal breathing, um, and what their current medications that they were on. So again, putting this into a table format, um, red flags would be minimal or no prodrome. They just went down just like that. The triggers being exertional, emotional express, auditory, meaning a, a fire alarm, um, the, the bell at school, all those things, or postpartum. Did they have amnesia where they can't remember anything about that day or the events? And they required CPR. The vanilla faint, which is a, a famous Dr. Ackerman term, uh, who's very much a part of the SADS Foundation, are the type that are a normal faint that may not indicate uh, an arrhythmic syncope. Usually these patients would have dizziness or tunnel vision, meaning they, they describe you know, their vision kind of going black. Sometimes their hearing changes too, where it sounds muffled. They feel warm, they feel nauseous. Their triggers can be at rest or positional where they stood up too fast or they were standing for too long. They have good recall, they never lost a pulse. These are what I would call a vanilla faint. Either way, if you have any concerns, any cardiologist or, or primary care doctor would be happy to see these patients if you have any worry about, those, about the fainting spell. Um, also, the American Heart Association has a 14 element screening. I think many of you have seen these. These are the, these are the sports physicals. The family history that they look for asks about premature death, yet less than the uh, age of 50 due to heart disease, disability from heart disease, less than the age of 50, a family history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, long QT syndrome, Marfan syndrome, congenital heart disease, or other significant disease in the family that could indicate a sudden death condition. Personal history, patients, do they have chest pain related to exertion, unexplained syncope or near syncope, excessive unexplained dyspnea, difficulty breathing, fatigue, palpitation of exercise, and elevated blood pressure. And uh, these are two additional um, screening elements that were added several years ago. If a we asked if the patient has had prior restrictions from sports or prior testing for the heart ordered by a physician. This doesn't mean we're going to restrict them, just means we may look into them a little bit more to make sure we're, we're getting all of the information that is needed. Physical exam includes listening for a heart murmur, feeling femoral pulses, looking for the physical stigmata of Marfan, which is usually very tall or thin uh, uh, patients, and again, checking your blood pressure. So sports classifications, any patient, even with these genetic conditions, are able to do class 1A, which is in, in this bottom left corner. This includes bowling, cricket, curling, golf, rivalry, or yoga. Going to the top right box here, um, boxing, canoeing, kayaking, those have an increase in static component, an increase in dynamic component. There are certain conditions that we will allow certain sports. Um, but like I said, any patients can play these class 1A sports. Moving ahead, what about sports safety? I think even if we do clear a patient for sports, which we would be very specific on our recommendations, things can go, things that we would recommend for sports safety include not swimming alone, especially with long QT syndrome and in murky water. Patients with long QT syndrome usually can have more significant events or higher risk of events while swimming. Doesn't mean kids can't swim, but you need a lifeguard and a one-on-one -on -one observation with these patients. So obviously a lake that has a murky bottom makes it very challenging if a patient has a vent underwater. So we do recommend if we, if we, if we do allow them to swim, which we will, um, that they don't swim alone. Secondly, which we'll talk about a little bit in more detail going forward, is an automatic external defibrillator at the school or at sports. And this is something that we'll get into in a little bit, but th these patients all need prompt defibrillation if they were to have an episode. Uh, an emergency plan. Um, many of you school nurses out there are very well uh, uh, prepared with school plans. We'll get to that a little bit more on what to do if there's an emergency or what to look for. We wanna make sure they're compliant with their medication, being, meaning compliant with beta blocker. What we, what we tell families is if the child has missed a beta blocker or did not take it that morning, they should not engage in sports or any competitive athletics. Um, we want to avoid excessive heat. Um, so having them, you know, again, just cooling off, not doing three day practices in 95 degree weather, that's important. And again, also playing with other kids. So we have people who are around them. 
as I said earlier, making sure uh, we're not overheating our patients and making sure they're staying well hydrated. Patients can pass out for normal reasons like due to dehydration, but I, obviously if they have one of these conditions, I would suspect that everyone would call 911, which would be a big deal for kind of what's called a vanilla faint. So we encourage our patients to stay very well hydrated and again, avoiding overheating. So the American Academy of Pediatrics recently published um, guidelines for um, what to do in sudden death conditions. This, the, the reference can be found at the bottom of my slide. They recommend that all children should be evaluated for sudden cardiac death, sudden cardiac death conditions during routine, routine health care, meaning those questions we just talked about, a thorough and detailed history, family history, physical examination are necessary to begin assessing for sudden cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death risk. If there are concerns, the EKG should be the first ordered test when there's concern for this and interpreted by a physician who is trained in recognizing electrical heart disease. EKG should not be performed in isolation without clinical history and referral to a specialist should be considered if there's an abnormality or any concern. When the EKG is printed, it will give you an interpretation. The AAP recommends you not trusting, not trusting the computer interpretation because it often can be wrong. And again, the EKG should be interpreted by a trained physician or trained provider who can recognize electrical heart disease. The American Academy of Pediatrics also recommends being prepared. And they state it is important to advocate for emergency action plans, which is called secondary prevention, and CPR training in the community. CPR and AEDs are effective for secondary um, sudden cardiac arrest prevention. Survivors of sudden cardiac arrest and family members of sudden cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac death victims should have a thorough evaluation to assess for the potential of genetic etiology. So we would perform cascade screening on any family member of a survivor of sudden cardiac arrest or a sudden cardiac death victim. These next couple slides come from my very good uh, colleague who's on the call today, Gwen Foss, who is part of Project Adam, which I will talk about in a little bit. This is um, a cardiac emergency response plan, which comes from the American Heart Association, and the reference is here. And they state the mere presence of an AED and our bystanders with CPR training is not adequate should sudden cardiac arrest occur. Development of the cardiac emergency response plan requires input from the school nurse and the other key school and community personnel in addition to EMS. This document highlights the role of the school nurse in response to um, any sort of emergency at school. This is a, a group effort here, a team effort, I would say. So the family and the patient or the child is in the center here. And as cardiologists, so I'm in purple cardiology team, we work with the community and the school. We work with the primary care provider. We make work with psychology. If there's some sort of um, event in the family, we work very closely with genetics and pathology if we need genetic testing. And we also work with social work. Obviously, obviously these patients need to be compliant with medication. So if we are having trouble, with compliance or um, financial issues of getting the medications, we need to work very closely with social work in order to provide the proper treatment for these patients and children. SAD school nurse resources are listed here. There is a school nurse packet, which um, has a risk assessment, brochure, posters. It can be found on the SAD's website. Also on the SADS website are individualized care plans for long QT, Brigada syndrome, CPVT, ARVC. Um, it, is, it is back to school time right now, so I've spent my last two months at work filling out these plans, which is, I think, very helpful for school nurses to know exactly what to do based on, on the different diagnoses. And it's a very succinct and well-designed uh, care plan for each one of these diseases. There's also sample cardiac emergency action plans, which can be located on the SADS website as well. Project Adam, I'm gonna to briefly touch on again, thanks to Gwen for providing these um, slides and, and always being willing to support um, the, re re the close relationship between Project Adam and, and the SADS Foundation. So Project Adam is in memory of Adam Lemmel with Children's Hospital of Wisconsin and stands for Automatic, Automated Defibrillators in Adam's Memory. So Project Adam for Adam. Project Adam advocates for cardiac emergency plans in schools, which includes CPR training, having a response team, having AED availability and um, the management and, and being able to use AED, 
they encourage drills in schools, just like we have drills for fires and tornadoes. It is important to have drills on what to do if there is an event at school. They also recommend considering this for after school athletics or, or other um, groups that may be in the school after hours. This is a national affiliate. There's a network of experience across the, the United States. Um, we are part of Project Adam at the University of Michigan. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about other centers that are, are part of Project Adam. In particular, uh, Project Adam supports Heart Safe Schools. Um, they recommend implementing, implementing Heart Safe Schools and information on that can be found at the Project Adam website, which is listed here. Um, and this again describes um, the uh, Project Adam goal, which to, is, is to assist schools and communities in establ establishing an emergency plan, um, which will hopefully decrease the, the uh, risk of sudden cardiac death um, in these patients. Project Adam, there are 29 established affiliates in 23 states. Um, the highlights, one, the ones that we have established programs are highlighted in red, um, and there's some in, in progress, which are in the, the darker gray, and patient, or states that don't have current affiliates are in light gray. So if your state does not have uh, Project Adam um, and you are interested in learning more about it, you can, you can go to the Project Adam site, which is listed here. I'm gonna stop here and take any questions. Again, here's our contact information. My name is Bryn, and then this is um, Alice Lara, who's the uh, CEO of SADS, who's on the call as well. The SADS website, phone number, emails, anything that, that you need. Um, but I'd like to thank all of you for being here today. I'd like to thank uh, SADS for inviting me um, here. And also, again, thanking Project Adam, Adam for the collaboration with SADS. Um, and together we are, um, with, with all of you, we're hoping to uh, decrease the risk of, of patients who have um, incidences or death from these, um, these types of diseases. Thank you very much, Bryn. This was fabulous. And I wanted to just ask if anyone has questions, more comments, please put something in the, in the chat for us and we can follow up here. Oh, there's a correction on our phone number for SADS Foundation. Um, we have a comment, uh, have a, had a student with WPW, had surgery and now doing very well. It was very scary at the time. Thank you for yes. sharing. Very yeah. scary at the time, but Wolf Parkinson White is something that um, we definitely can uh, take care of. So I love kind of the end point with those patients. They come in, we fix them, they, they, they're cured. And all the resources that Bryn mentioned during the presentation, we put in the chat, the website, sads.org slash awareness slash school nurses. So you can find all of these resources, care plans, et cetera, there. You're welcome. Okay, any other comments or questions for Bryn? I'd like to thank you all for the work that you do. I have two middle schoolers, so um, I very much, uh, look to the school nurses to keep my children safe during the day. So I, I definitely appreciate what you all do. I know many of you are in Michigan as well. So hopefully we'll, we'll cross paths at some point. Yes. Oh, so um, someone said that uh, they have a recent Brigada patient. Um, and, um, you know, again, key points with Brigada is, is fever treatment. Um, so just getting, you know, Tylenol or, or um, ibuprofen on board pretty quickly. Um, is, is helpful for these patients. Yeah, thank you, Kaylee. You have a care plan for that Brigada patient too. That's wonderful. And then Sarah said that she has a sixth grader with long QT syndrome, a plan in place, great. Um, mother said the student is more at risk during this age period. So definitely true in, in some sense, um, you know, as patients, it depends on the type of long QT. Um, you, you are, you can become safer as you age. So, so kids obviously who are, you know, active and, um, especially when they get into teenage years, it makes it very challenging to make sure that they're compliant. You can't, you know, shove pills down 13 year olds throats. Um, so, you know, the, the, they are a little bit more risk because just of, um, genetics is, itself. And then also just, you know, the way that younger kids might be. Um, but, you know, our, our restrictions are, are lessening for patients with long, uh, with long QT syndrome. We are, um, our biggest push now is what Project Adam and, and SAD supports, which is secondary prevention. We want these kids to, um, you know, we want them to be normal. We want them to be active, but we also want them to be safe. So having these plans and having AEDs in, um, around will be the most important thing 
um, for these patients and working very closely with, with cardiology. Good question about um, student athletes after um, return to play for, for COVID. Um, so there is lots to come on that. Um, we are still learning, uh, we're still learning that. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, University of Michigan also has had um, some information that's published out there. Um, Gwen, I, I know Gwen's on the call. If you have the information on the return to play that we wrote at U of M, um, she could put into the chat or we can talk later, but return to play is, is, a, is a very good subject at the moment after COVID. Um, I am part of the research that's that's being done, you know, at U, U of M, um, and it's evolving. It very much is evolving, and I think it will continue to evolve over time. A great question. I think I missed one, Marcia. Someone with There's, OCT. Right? Um, yeah, they had a ten-year-old with a heart rate of two fifty, had uh, SVTs, mm -hmm. and after the incident, all five in the building did Project Adam, and they're now heart safe. That's great. I mean, that, you know, SVT is, it, I didn't talk about that today. It's, it's usually not a life-threatening condition, but I think it reminds us that things can happen at school and we need to be prepared. So I, you know, I'm very, very much in support of, of, of preparation. You know, I think to myself all the time, when was the last time we had a tornado that's in, in my area? I think tornadoes obviously are very prevalent in other areas of the country, but we still do those drills a couple of times a year. And I think um, credit arrest, you know, it, it kind of ranks up there with, with those types of emergencies. So Sarah asked, uh, has a female student, is there any more risk due to hormonal issues? Good question. Um, can vary. So I wouldn't say that they are more at, at risk. Um, the, it, it, we don't exactly know how hormones can play into these in, in some of these conditions. We do in others, but I would, I would not restrict them anymore because she's a female. Mm -hmm. Oh, you have a student. So someone has a student has a, who's getting an ablation today. Um, I wonder if it's, if you're in Michigan, wow. it could be in our lab, but <laughs> um, <laughs> we're doing one today. Uh, so again, you know, Will Parkinson White is, is kind of our bread and butter. It's something we do a couple times uh, a week at, at U of M in particular. Um, and it's, like I said, it's something that we can, we can cure. Um, it's scary to know about it, but it's also, you know, one of our things that we can easily get rid of. So thanks for bringing that up. And I'm glad that you, you know, I gave a very simplistic overview of 1QT1, 2, and 3. Those are the most common type, um, but I would be happy to share more information. And Gwen, thank you very much for putting uh, the information about return to play. We worked on that, I think, last, I don't know, this year or last year or something. So that this is um, from Mott Children's Hospital. And I think there'll be more to come as we know, as we know more, but this is a great starting point. So thank you, Gwen, for adding that in there. And Bren, I'll just add that um, we have um, created documents that can be updated, but so far we haven't had to update them. The, the advice has stayed pretty consistent. Yep. And we, at U of M, we were involved in uh, national research on return to play after COVID and what to do when patients come in uh, with complaints of chest pain and things like that. So we'll, you know, we're, we're, in, a, we're in a spot where we're getting a lot of information. And so this, this is probably a helpful document. So thank you for adding that. Mm -hmm. Any more questions or comments? Or feedback, if you think I went too fast, too slow, I didn't give you enough information, happy to, to add anything else. We had a comment earlier, wonderful presentation. Thank you, thank you all. Again, thank you for all the hard work you guys do. All right, I'm sure you're all on your lunch break, so, or many of you are on your lunch break if you're on the East Coast. And so thank you for being, being uh, with us today. Mm -hmm. So very positive comments from everyone in the chat. And if you have any um, you know, general questions that we didn't cover, you can always send an email to sads at sads.org as well. Uh, we had a question to share slides. We're, we're happy to do that. We can share uh, friend slides, no problem. We encourage you to all share this with your other fellow nurses, staff, administration. Sarah, you wanted to add a comment? You're muted, Sarah. 
Unmute. Okay, there, there I go. go. There you go. Um, I recently at one of my private schools um, was notified about a sixth grade girl that I was talking about. And so I went to your website, which is wonderful, worked on developing the plan, was talking to the mother about it. And, um, you know, the mom, the mom was great. She didn't understand why I needed a plan in place. And I told her that, you know, when I'm training staff, it's good to have paperwork for like, you know, when we're using an EpiPen, there are steps they take. And so I finally won her over on, on getting a plan in place. Um, but, you know, she wants her daughter to be like all the other kids. And she said, put her socks on one at a time. And, and you know, I clearly understand this, but, you know, the staff is, is a little on guard, but now that we've got the plan, I'm gonna be meeting with them again. Um, and fortunately this school has seven AEDs in the building. Um, so, you know, we're, we're good on that. And I, I have been practicing recently, but, um, you know, it's just, I think, you know, interesting to talk to a parent, uh, when the, you, this is my first student with, um, with long QT, I've, I've got a kid with Wolf Park, Parker, um, syndrome, uh, is it Wolf, Wolf, Wolf Parker? Parkinson White. Yep. White. Yep. yep. Um, but, um, you know, it's, I just think it's interesting to come from the, you know, approaching a parent and how they're, they're wanting their child to be normal, but then the, the staff is like, well, you know, questioning sports and all of this. So any advice on, you know, just how to work with the staff and the parent so this, this um, student can have um, as normal of a um, school year as possible. Yeah, I mean, we do, I mean, as I said earlier, we really do want patients to, to live as much of a normal life, but also be prepared. And I think having a school action plan um, would, would help you decide what to do in an emergency, but you wouldn't, I mean, I would assume you're not gonna put this patient in a bubble and not allow her to, to play sports or, or whatever, treat her any differently. So I think what your answer was, which is, hey, we just need an action plan to know what to do in an emergency, but otherwise she's gonna be in line with, with everyone else. And it's the same thing, as you said, with an EpiPen. We're not gonna not allow the child to go outside because there could be a bee out there. We just wanna know what to do if they get stung by a bee. And as a nurse practitioner, I'll tell you, I work very closely with school nurses. I get phone calls from them all the time from trainers, coaches, whatever. Um, and we're happy to kind of share our, you know, one-to-one -one time if you have questions about something specifically. Yeah, and I, I actually am a consultant with Children's Hospital Colorado, and so I had been in touch with our cardiology department about this student. So I, um, I know that I could probably reach out to them um, to provide more um, if needed um, to help out my staff. Yep. Thank you. And then the, I see one last question, then we'll kind of um, probably end the left cardiac sympathetic generation. Yeah, can I can I just tell Sarah that Courtney White is the Project Adam coordinator at Children's Colorado, so you might want to check in with her. Thank you. And sure. then we'll we'll left cardiac sympathetic denervation prevent cardiac arrest um, percentage wise. I don't remember the percentage off the top of my head. It it reduces the risk of cardiac arrest. Um, we do. There's nothing that's perfect that completely can prevent it. It is used for very particular specific patients. It does reduce it, um, but there can still be breakthrough events um, even despite having a sympathetic cardiac denervation, which is why the same thing that we say with beta blocker, it does significantly reduce the risk of something happening. But that's why we still need a plan in place, even if they've had some sort of. Um, procedure. Besides Wolf Parkinson White, which is a curative procedure, all of these significantly reduce the risk. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Bryn, for a fabulous presentation. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, it is recorded and it, it, we want it to be shared with your fellow uh, colleagues. So thank you very much for joining. Thank you all. Go blue. <laughs> <laughs>